everybody, Tiffany here from the Battleship Iowa. Today we are off site at a community partner, the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, to talk a little bit more about buoyancy. Last week we focused on object buoyancy and ship buoyancy. Today we're actually going to take a look at marine animal buoyancy, the animals that live in the water and how they control how deep or how shallow they are in the water column. Let's go inside and check it out. With us today, we have marine science educator Carl. Hi, Carl. Nice to meet you. Hello. We are standing in the kelp room at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. We have this gorgeous tank full of fish behind us. Carl, can you share some cool facts with us about how these fish float through the water? I would love to. Oh, uh, well, most of these fish in here, actually all of these fish in here, are what we call bony fish. And they're the fish most people are familiar with. And most bony fish have something inside them called a swim bladder. Swim bladder, think of it as kind of like a balloon. The fish can actually fill it up with gas from its blood, usually oxygen. And that balloon will help keep the fish where the fish wants to be in the water column. So like you can see this orange fish right here is just sort of hanging there, floating there in the water. It's what we call neutrally buoyant. The fins are moving to keep it in place with the water current, but it's not floating up, it's not sinking down, and it's not struggling to stay in position. That's because it's made its swim bladder expand enough to keep it right at that level. And that's important because all of these fish have certain requirements, certain foods, certain temperatures, certain solidity that they need to do best at. And those conditions are always changing in the ocean. So if you can make yourself mutually point and stay where things are optimal for you, where it's best, that is the best place for you to be. And if you do that without spending a lot of energy to do that, that's even better. When we've all been in water, we've all uh, splashed around, and if you've ever been in a pool and tread water, you know it takes a lot of energy to stay in one, one place like that. If you could just make yourself perfectly buoyant and not have to move at all to stay where you want it to be, that would be much easier for you. And you wouldn't have to eat as much, and you could devote more energy into growing and having babies. So these are all fish that are somewhat shallow and relatively close to shore. Let's go take a look at some deeper water fish see the challenges of that, and then check out some fish that actually don't have swim bladder. So these fish are from deeper water. And the deeper in the water you go, the more pressure there is on you. And that creates a challenge for these animals with their swim bladder. They can regulate it at slow, at a slow process, and they can move up and down where the pressure will decrease as they go up or increase as they go deeper. But if they're caught by fishermen and pulled up, they can't adjust their swim bladder fast enough, and that swim bladder will expand as the pressure decreases, kind of like a balloon blowing up larger and larger and larger until it either pushes their organs out of their mouth or it can actually explode. So that is a challenge with deep water fish, especially at an aquarium, to keep them alive without injuring them because their gas bladders expand so much. We brought them slowly and are put in a special container to make sure the pressure stays well and then slowly brought down at their own pace. So I said we'd look at some fish that don't have swim bladders. Most of the bony fish have swim bladders, but not all do. Some of the deep water fish, because they will never ever surface and they live on the bottom anyway, don't need one. So they don't actually create a swim bladder in their bodies. The other type of fish are called cartilaginous fishes. And that's sharks, skates, and rays. And they, none of them, have swim bladders but they can still control their buoyancy. And that's an important feature for all these animals in the water. You need to be able to stay where you are. The sharks, skates, and rays do it, however, by oil. If you've ever mixed oil and water, you know the oil floats on top. It's less dense, 
and so it, it rises to the surface. Sharks, skates, and rays have very large livers, and these livers are filled with oil. And that is how they control their buoyancy, keeping them up where their food is, or down where their food is, depending on where they live, by maintaining a balance of the right amount of oil in their liver to keep them where they need to be. Again, it's a slow process like the, like the swim bladder, but it does work, and it's worked for sharks for hundreds of millions of years. So another resident of the ocean would be the marine mammals. Seals, sea lions, walruses, whales, and dolphins, and even sea otters. They all live in the ocean and have to maintain some buoyancy uh, conditions that are proper for them to do. A lot, not so much for feeding, but for breathing. Marine mammals are air breathers, so they need to be able to get to the surface without expending a lot of energy get there so they can breathe, and so they can stay at the surface and breathe as, as well. Seals, sea lions, walruses, whales, and dolphins tend to do this mostly with blubber. Their fat that surrounds their body. They have a lot of fat, and the fat is oil-filled, like with the sharks, and it makes them buoyant. Most of these are still somewhat negatively buoyant, which helps because they need to go down in the water to get their food but they need to be able to get up to the surface and not expend a lot of energy to be able to get there so they can keep breathing. There's one whale called the right whale that has so much blubber that it actually floats on the surface all the time, which isn't a bad thing because it eats small plankton that float along at the surface of the water. So being at the top all the time is good for them. Seals and sea lions also have a blubber layer that helps them not only stay warm, but control their buoyancy, but sea otters are really small and they don't have a blubber layer. They control their buoyancy by trapping air in their fur. So they can control that by keeping their fur really clean so it traps all the air bubbles in there and floats to the surface. Birds do the same thing, by the way, like penguins and diving birds. They're going to be underwater. They can control their buoyancy and get back to the surface by trapping air under their feathers. Thank you, Carl, for all the wonderful information. We're going to take a look at one more type of animal living in the water that has to control its buoyancy, and it's called plankton, right? Yes. Do you want to tell us a little bit about plankton before we get started? Okay. Well, plankton are small, generally small, sometimes microscopic plants and animals, well, organisms, that live in the water column. And they need to control their buoyancy to uh, get to where their food is, in the case of the animal ones. But the ones that are plant-like need to be able to stay where they can get the sunlight, but also not so close to the surface that they get hit by ultraviolet radiation, which gives us sunburn, but which can actually kill something as small as plankton. So their buoyancy control is a very critical issue for them as well. And like the sharks, skates, berries, and some of the other fish, and the marine mammals, they actually use oil to do this for the most part. All right, thank you, Carl. We are going to do what is called the plankton drop challenge, I understand it. Yes. So we're going to build plankton? Yes. And we're going to race them? Yes. Okay. We'll try. Let's head over to the race site. We'll be right back. So what materials do we have to build our plankton in here, Carl? We have a lot of little things that we can connect together. Little pieces, let me just show the whole thing right here. Pipe cleaners, wheels, all sorts of shapes and uh, pieces to interconnect to create our plankton. And also a little wood, what are called biscuits, uh, to provide some body for it. And that's all important because when you look at actual plankton, a lot of them have these things sticking off to the sides of them. It has, there we go. Like in this picture right here. And you see those little pieces sticking off to the side, those also help with buoyancy. By, be, by having these pieces that stick way out, it makes it sink much slower. So it doesn't have to, to depend so much on oils or other things inside to keep it floating. The, uh, the appendages keep it from sinking too fast. That's very cool. 
okay, so if you had a tip for somebody trying to build this, you'd say add appendages? I would say add appendages, but carefully, because these things add weight. They add mass to the body. So the more you put on, the heavier you'll be, and the more you'll need to keep from sinking. And so it kind of makes what's called a, 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 a feedback loop. You put more on, you get too heavy. You put more on, you get too heavy. So you don't want to sink too fast because that takes you out of your life range. You want to sink slowly if you sink, sink at all. Or if you don't, or if, uh, if you put too much mass on, you need more oil. So you need to make more oil, which means you can't go put so much energy into growing or reproducing. So strategies would be to add appendages to help you slow, but keep your weight down. It's a trick, and people have a hard time with it. But plankton, they've got it down pat. So this is our raceway right here. This is. This is the actual drop tank. Okay, and are there any rules we need to know about before we start building? Yes. You need to make sure that it fits inside the tank and doesn't touch the side. The, the opening is small, so it can be squeezed in and uh, get in it without touching the sides. That's one. You need to use one of the small wooden biscuits, at least one, in your creation. And timing starts when you drop it. And again, you want to, uh, you actually want to place it in and let go of it. Because if you drop it, you might catch air bubbles, which will cause it to float. And if it doesn't sink at all, that does, that's no good because again, you want to be able to sink. So you place, place it on the water, let go of it, and time it till it reaches the bottom. As soon as any part of it touches the bottom, that's when you're done. So if you have things hanging off the bottom, your main part may be still up in the water, but as soon as any part of it touches down, the timing is over. Okay. I think that should be about it. Other than that, uh, pretty much anything goes. Oh, and, and again, it must sink just slowest sinking. Okay. Actually, what would be what would be perfect, the, the, the perfect plankton drop model would be to get about halfway down and stop and just float there. That would be awesome. Have you ever seen that before? I have not, although I did this on a tank which was twice the size of this, and I had one student, it took over 90 seconds, <laughs> wow. so over a minute for it to reach the bottom. That was as close to perfect as I've ever seen. Nice. So that's that's like your record is yes. over 90 seconds. Yes. Okay. I can't remember the exact number, but I remember it's over a minute and a half. Well, let's see if we can beat it today. <laughs> let's give it a try. All right. All right, everybody, we are going to time Carl's plankton first. I will be using the stopwatch on my phone. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Looks like mine's a floater. <laughs> no winner here. Oh, yeah. Yep. Too late. Process, right, Carl? That is right. You gotta test it and then you can go back, modify it, and try again. Alright, I have my little plankton. Let's see if I can get mine to sink slowly or if it's gonna be a floater like Carl's. I'm gonna go ahead and get in position and start. <laughs> <laughs> no luck. It's down to air bubbles. Oh, oh, maybe. As you can see, Carl and I both had kind of glitchy first prototype builds. We're going to go back, modify our builds, see if we can make them sink a little bit better, and we'll race in round two. Okay, so I added a few things, a little bit more mass down here. 
on the uh, on the arms and a little more mass weight in the center there. Hopefully this will get it down below the surface, but not too much. Unfortunately, you have one of those long arm sit down. Yeah. So for my prototype, I actually switched out the um, round bits I had on the end for these little triangular things, trying to decrease the weight since mine did actually sink once all the air bubbles were out of it. So I'm trying to make it sink a little bit slower. Let's see how it works. Uh. <laughs> All right. So Carl is the winner by a second or so, <laughs> roughly a second. Four It was my pleasure. I had a good time uh, helping you and your students yeah. learn more about Feng Shui in the ocean. Yeah. And this is your STEM challenge for the week. So we want you to build a plankton out of supplies you have at home. You could use pencils, you could use Q-tips, you could use tape, uh, paper clips, whatever you'd like to do. Take a picture of it and then Use a stopwatch or count the one Mississippi to Mississippi and see how long it takes for your plankton to sink down to the bottom of a bucket or your sink or your bathtub and uh, see if you can beat our times today. I came in a little over four <laughs> seconds. Carl came in a little over five seconds. Hopefully you guys can beat that. <laughs> Try to get to that record that Carl's student had in the past of 90 seconds. And don't be afraid to make changes and keep uh, making trials get the perfect thinking plankton. Exactly. It's part of the engineering process, you guys. You want your challenge of sinking slowly. You've got to look at what materials you have at home and then build your prototype and test it over and over again until you get the best one. Alright, until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.